Okay, it's time. Let's start. Welcome to this uh, late afternoon session on a modular approach to development process. What does it mean? A few words about myself. My name is Yuval Lowy. I'm a software architect. I'm the principal of iDesign. We specialize in .NET architecture. We do a fair amount of training as well. I'm also the Microsoft regional director for the Silicon Valley. I do not work for Microsoft. I work a lot with Microsoft. I'm now working on the third edition of my WCF book. should be published late summer. Even though I do not work for Microsoft, I was privileged to be part of the strategic design effort for both .NET and WCF. I write a lot of magazine articles, uh, tend to write system-wide papers for Microsoft. A few years ago, Microsoft said I'm a software legend, a bit of a vain title, but that's what they keep for the world top 608 due to my impact on the industry. If you need to get in touch with me, it's uh, idesign.net. Here's the objective for tonight. We're going to discuss how the development process is affected by the fact that you are using a modular approach for your system. Now, what is a modular approach? The day before, yesterday, we called these things objects. And if you're using plain.net, these are actually components. And if you move into the wonderful world of service orientation, these would be services. But it doesn't really matter. What I'm going to discuss with you affects all these approach, approaches of commoditizing your system and trying to make it more modular. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you how some key process areas are affected by the fact you're using now modules. Clearly, each area has more to it. We can spend a week on project planning. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about how project planning is affected by the fact we now use modules. The process I'm going to share with you works well in small teams. Do you know why? Because small teams work well. Big teams simply don't work. And why is that? It's because there's a fundamental difference in software between efficiency and efficacy. What does it mean? The most efficient unit is the individual. 1 plus 1 in software is not 2. It's like 1.7. And you add another one, it's not 3. It's 2.4. Because of the inherent communication overhead. So the individual is very efficient. Unfortunately, it may not be effective. If, you're ten, if you have a 10 man year project, giving it for one guy to do and waiting 10 years is very efficient. It's not very effective. At which point you may want to chop it off into uh, maybe seven guys working on it for two years, and will get it after uh, uh, two years as opposed to ten. Not very efficient, just more effective. What I'm going to talk about is what happens when a relatively small, manageable, efficient team is assigned a unit of work, a project, or a subsystem. Everything I'm going to discuss with you is practice in real life, either been practiced by me running projects or working with the iDesign customers. Every chart, every metric, it's all real life. I haven't synthesized anything. It's all from the trenches covered in blood and muck. OK. Here is what you're trying to build. You're all trying to do this. What does it mean? You take a bunch of modules, component services, you glue it together, you say, that's my application. Anybody's trying to do anything else? No. We agree this is what you're trying to do, right? Unfortunately, there's a problem here. And the problem is, Doing this is a lot more complex than not doing this. There's an inherent degree in such a system, regardless of what the system is trying to do. Simply the interaction between the modules, the services, whatever the technology is, introduces a degree of complexity into your system. And as time goes by, the complexity increases. So if we were using just, say, C++, this would be C++ object, we're using C++ glue. And then we move into the world of .NET, and we use .NET components, and now these are CLR glue. And we have issues with garbage collection and security and such. Moving to WCF, now these are services. You've got issues with security, hosting, instance management, transaction, and on and on and on. Completely independent of what happened in the scope of your service or in the scope of your system. And what I've found is that this is a major infliction on the way you execute the project. And unless you have a handle on that inherent degree of complexity, it will not actually uh, uh, succeed. And I first observed that years and years ago. So a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far away, I was a software architect. The project wasn't too big, it wasn't too small, some 40 man years. And we had all the superficial ingredients for success. The project was properly staffed. Uh, I was given permission to use the latest technology. I personally trained the developers on the technology of the day. 
management was fully committed for doing things right, and yet the project was a disaster, a complete disaster. I don't think to this day they haven't shipped anything. And you have to be a genius to figure out that this is a failure. And I kept asking myself, why? Now I can tell you, I've learned a lot since, but I was pretty sharp then too. Which means, we are, I was the architect, we had a good design. We're not failing because of the design. What about technology? Well, the technology was great. Couldn't get a better technology. So if it's not the design, it's not the technology, what's left? It's the process. But management was following what the books are saying about the best practice for process. And what I realized is that the process management we're trying to follow is literally killing the project because it's not aligned with the way my design is calling for the project to be built. So I started looking at the key process and start aligning them with the modular approach to design. And you can see that it will affect everything. And that's basically some of the highlights I'm going to share with you uh, tonight. Okay, so let's start with the key process area of project planning. A project plan is not a Gantt chart. If I could wave a magic wand and make all Gantt charts go away, I would. <laughs> Gantt charts are positively evil. Do you know why? Because they give management illusion of control. A Gantt chart is merely an elaborate scheduler. I will show you if you do things right in a highly modular way, at which point in time you have to generate a Gantt chart. There is some information you have to glean out of it. After that, you don't really need it. Sadly, you're going to have to furnish it to the knuckle draggers. So, you know, you have to keep it. But by and large, it's almost immaterial to the project plan. Project plan is how you staff the project. What is the life cycle of the product? What is the life cycle of the service? How do you put them together? So let's start tackling the first key area, which is staffing the project. And for that, I'm going to have to ask you a series of questions. My first question, is this a good design? Suppose this is a design diagram for your system. One big thing. Is this a good design? Now, how come I hear only a few of you doing this? How come none of you should be a resounding no? Will you ever do this? Will you ever have the following design? And surely you agree that you can do it in any system. The whole code of the system is in one function, in one file, in one class. The function takes 17,000 parameters, and it's if, if, else, 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 if. You agree that in theory you can do any system in the world like this? Maybe it's one class with 7,000 methods. It still looks the same, by the way. You agree you can do any system in the world that way. My question to you, will you ever do it? No. We agree this is categorically bad? Does it matter what it does? No. Suppose this is your design. Millions of little things running all over the place. Is this a good design? Will you ever do this? Will you ever have the following? Every line of code in a separate method, in a separate class, in a separate file, in a separate assembly, in a separate service. Will you ever do this? No. We know this is a bad design. Good. Is this a good design? How can you say yes? You don't know anything about what it does. <laughs> so I can't say that it's, it's a good design. What can I say? Yes, it's better. This is better than this and that. Do we all agree this is better? Is this a good design? But, but I haven't changed the same number of services inside. Now, how could it possibly be? If you think about it, this is nothing short of a miracle. How could it possibly be that without us knowing the first thing about what the system is doing, we know this design is better than this or that? Must be a miracle. Well, it's not a miracle. It's because whenever you evaluate a design, you're doing this in your head. You may not even be aware you're doing, but this is what you always do. What does it mean? Whenever you implement a modular system, you pay for two things. You pay for the cost of implementing the modules, and you pay for the cost of integrating them. There's nothing else, really. Now, let me try and plot the cost of implementing a system as a function of its decomposition. And since we agree that in theory you can decompose any system in any number of ways, lots of little things, one big thing, few big things, then I have here on the, on the axis here the number of services and then the cost involved. The blue line is the cost per service or per module. The red line is the cost of integration. 
Now let's look at a system that has very few things, somewhere around here, maybe just one. Obviously this graph can't start at zero, this graph starts at one. A system that has just one big thing, what is the cost per service? Astronomical. But what is the integration cost in such a system? Zero. There is no integration cost, it is what it is. A system that has millions of little things running all over the place, what is the cost per service, per module? It's a, it's a little bit of a service, it's nothing. But the integration cost is horrendous. Note also that these two lines are not linear for different reasons. The cost per service is not linear because complexity is not linear to size. Something twice as big is not twice as complex. It's four times as complex, six times as complex. True? Integration is not linear to size because the number of ways you have of putting something together is not linear to the number of things that you have. It's roughly an order of n squared. If I'm allowing callbacks, the order of the polynomial will go up. So I know these two lines are nonlinear. They go wacky at the edges. I also have here in grid, in a green line here, the sum of the red line and the blue line at any point on the chart. This is the actual sum I did in Excel. And what do we see? We see that we have an area of minimal cost. And in the area of minimal cost, the services are not too big and not too small and not too many and not too few. It's just right. So when you design a system, you want to be in the area of minimal cost. Now, no, I'm not saying smack here at the center. Here, 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 it's all good enough. For technical people, I often have to point out that good enough is by definition good enough. <laughs> in fact, I would argue a point I made yesterday as well. How many attended my session yesterday? Good. I made a point yesterday that every design effort has a point of diminishing return. Remember that? Now look at it. Suppose you're here. Right here. No, it just you leave it, you get here. Now suppose you're going to spend a lot of effort refactoring this design from here to here. What you have gained is this much. Now taking a system from here to here maybe another three, four months of refactoring and you're going to be saving two weeks of development effort. Does it strike you as a good balance? This clearly shows us that any design effort always has a point of diminishing return. You're in the area of minimal cost, stop. You're done. It's your point of diminishing return. What you don't want to do, you don't want to be at the edges. The edges are nonlinearly worse. What does it mean you're trying to fight a nonlinearly worse problem? There's a problem here. You see, the tools organizations have at their disposal are fundamentally linear. You can have another month. You can have another month. You can only add time in a linear manner. Here's another developer. Here's another developer. Can you afford to double up and double up and triple up and triple up and quadruple and quadruple your team? No. So the tools all organizations have are fundamentally linear in time and resources, and yet the nature of the problem is fundamentally non-linear. How can you succeed? Now what is a non-linear problem? It's a little bit worse. It's four times worse, 20 times worse, 200 times worse. The jump from four to 200 times worse is nothing for non-linear systems. You agree? Yes. Humans have a fundamental problem with nonlinear behavior. We know that, right? We cannot grasp it. We try to always extrapolate it. Well, we can't. And you have all seen it firsthand. How many times you talk to a colleague on a project or you go as a consultant and you ask, what is it about? And they, and they tell you about it. And you know, it's basically 11 developers working on this system for three years. It's a true story. And you're asking to yourself, you know, I can, maybe myself with some of this, we can knock this whole system in four months. How come 11 developers have been working on it for three years? Rings a bell? Yes, it's because they're somewhere at the edges. They're fighting a no any worse problem. Good luck. There's no way they can ever succeed. What we see here is something very fundamental. The mission in life of the architect is to bring the system to the area of minimal cost. Nothing else really matters. Think of it this way. You have two projects. One project is using .NET 5.0, VS 2012, 256 CPUs per machine. It's all in the cloud, uh, whatever. You can embellish it to your heart's content, but it's somewhere at the edges. This is another project that's still using .NET 2005, uh, .NET 2.0, basically just moving into generics. Uh, but they're here. Which project would you rather be on? I have two teams. 
One, they're all killers, WCF, expert WPF. They sleep and breathe silver light. They're unbelievable. They're moving mountains with their breath, but at the edges. Or a team that knows nothing, nothing about these technologies, but their design is there. Which team would you rather be on? So we see two observations here. The first is that since the mission of life, mission in life of the architect is to bring the system to the air of minimal cost, this is the architect's salute. <laughs> now, what we also see is that not being in the area of minimal cost is the number one risk for any project. Nothing else matters. Any argument, any risk. Time and time again, I have managers telling me, is uh, WCF ready for prime time? I'm saying, are you? <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. It's arranging the, arm decks, the armchair on the deck of the Titanic. It doesn't matter. It's far exceed the risk of the technology itself uh, or any other risk you may have. And so the first act of wisdom of planning a project is to staff it with an architect that gets it to the era of minimal cost. The architect may not even be consciously aware of doing this, but this is actually what the architect needs to do. Now, you could say, you know, I subscribe to this notion wholeheartedly. But there's a problem. The problem is doing this is not simple. It takes a lot of time for analyzing the requirements and kind of like this is a very contemplative, time-consuming process. And pity we don't have the time to discuss just on how to do that, because we could. But just explain to you how to do this will take another few hours. It's not that complicated. But the problem is it takes three or four months to do it. And until you've done that, there's really no point in even getting developers on board. What's the point? What are they going to be doing? And so you could say, no, I subscribe to this notion wholeheartedly. I'll get an architect. I'll get two or three of them. Let's just do it. Don't. Very quickly, you run into the nine women, one month's baby problem. How many months it takes for nine women to produce one baby? Mm, and how many months would MS Project tell you? Mm, a bit of a problem. A bit of a problem, isn't it? In fact, what I would find out that not only would having multiple architects not expedite it, will degrade it. Here's why. Multiple chefs always spoil the stew. Architects tend to be more senior guys, which means the other guy is an idiot. It's the two prima donnas, and you start having this negotiation. It's like designed by committee, right? I mean, I gave up on this point, you have to give up on this point. Instead of the horse, you end up with a camel. I mean, that's how it's going to end up with, right? What you lose if you involve multiple architects is you lose the integrity of the design if you do it. So even in large projects, it's absolutely pivotal to have a single architect involved. That's it. And if your project cannot be handled by one architect, you have to chop it into smaller projects that the architect can handle. There's no other way around it. And I can say that the converse is also true. If you have a project where there isn't a single person that understands all the design aspects of the whole system, you're doomed. It's that simple. So even in large projects, a single architect is all you need. Now, there's a problem here, and the problem is that architecture, on one hand, is lofty thoughts and all of that. On the other hand, it's a lot of gunk and, and, and legwork, going to all the design meetings and sitting with developers and doing design reviews and going and doing presentation to customers and get, polishing another aspect. And then you have 300 design diagrams and somebody renames something. You have to go and chase that string and everything in the diagrams. Now it's too long. It pushes to the other thing. You have to start arranging the furniture, right? You spend the whole afternoon just arranging furniture. There's no added value in doing it, of course. So what I recommend that you do is that if you have sufficiently complex and large project, assign a junior apprentice to the architect. That's another important staffing point. Good architects are a very rare resource. They're far from a commodity. It's not a warm body you can just staff. And there's always a shortage in good architects. And so what you do is you try and groom the next generation architects. You take an architect, junior architect, assign that to the uh, senior architect. Junior does also legwork going to design review, polishing diagrams and everything else, off-shouldering from the master the need to do that. Because that's the mission in life. Nothing else matters. Or an aside, that's how I started. You see, I have a natural knack for system design. I close my eyes, I see structures in software immediately. 
So even as an intern, you know, when I voiced, expressed concern, the interest in doing it, I said, oh, fine, you do it. You don't want to do it. But after doing it for like two years, I realized I've completely stalled. This is only so much you can learn from yourself. So I said, to reach the next level of enlightenment, I have to go and study with somebody. So I literally thought of an opportunity of, of being a junior somewhere. I kind of like it to swallow my pride. You know, I was already an architect and I have to be a junior architect. But I literally found a true master. You know, after a year with the guy, it was more or less like, you must realize, master, my knowledge of the force has surpassed yours. <laughs> and we're still good friends. Now, <laughs> once you're done with the composition, it's the only point in time you can actually assign it to developers. What you do is you assign it in a one-to-one -one ratio. Don't have two developers working on the same service. It's immediately creating a conflict. And when we looked yesterday at allocation to assemblies, it immediately ends up with, can you check it in because I need to check it out, check it in, check it out? Don't have one developer working on two services at the same moment in time. You just introduced a bottleneck into your process. Because now, you have, can you fix it because I need, no, you can't work because you're working on this. He has to put this because I need it. Right? There's a bottleneck in your system. So if you're doing a cross-section of the team, at any moment in time, we should see one-to-one -one mapping of developers to modules or services. Now, if there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the services or the modules and the developers, then the interaction between the modules and the services is being isomorphic to the interaction between the developers. Now, what does it mean? If we look at this diagram, you're all smiling. If you look at this one, you're all making a face. Why is this not so good as this? Well, I mean, the number of services is the same. But there's too many lines here, right? Remember the movie Amadeus when the Kaiser is saying to uh, Mozart, too many notes. There's too many notes. He didn't compose the, uh, the, the, the symphony here properly. Right? If you can do it like this, we know it's better. A good design always strives to minimize the number of interactions to their bare bone necessity. The smallest set of interaction you can possibly get away with, that's the design you want. You agree? Right. Now, if the mapping of services to developers is one to one, then the interaction between the services is a more effective interaction between the developers. Now, this is better than that because this is what we call a loosely coupled design. You can't have a totally decoupled design. It's, it's a dead design if it's totally decoupled. There has to be some degree of interaction, but you want to minimize it. It's loosely coupled. Now, this is a tightly coupled design. Inherent, de inherent degree of coupling inside. But this, because of the isomorphic relationship to developers, maps also the relationship between your developers. And so this would actually give you a loosely coupled team, and this will give you a tightly coupled team. What does it mean? A tightly coupled team tends to be a high stress, high friction team. Everybody gets to be very territorial. You can't just make a change here to blue because immediately red says, what about yellow? And green says, no, you can't change it because if you change it, you have to go to green. And oh my God. Let's call a meeting. <laughs> Seven guys went to two hours meeting. How much time is lost? A day. You lost a day. Silly meeting. You lost a day. Time and time again, I peek over the developer's shoulder. I see the schedule. It's a solid block of yellow. There's a little sliver of green. Man, Wednesday morning, 10 a.m., they can write some code. Rest of the time, they're going to meetings. Not good. Team that looks like this, I need to make a change to the gray one. Maybe blue is affected. Certainly, red is not affected. Right? And so what we see is an interesting observation. A good design will give you an efficient team. Which team do you think stands a better chance of meeting the deadline? A team that looks like this or a team that looks like this? And that's an interesting observation here. And here's one. Let's go back to the beginning and we'll discuss this diagram again. We said we all want to do that. We didn't actually say why. Why do we want to do that? Let's discuss the why. Starability. What is starability? Maintainability? Extensibility, reusability, right? Starability. Okay? Now, why do we get maintainability? Because if I need to make a change here to yellow, I go in inside, I'm surely unaffected blue here. If I need to maintain it, I can just mess around here. I can extend it, add maybe blacky here. I can take this green, plug it in another system. Starability. 
So traditionally, the interpretation of why do we need design was always for the sake of stability. Right? So every project manager will tell you stability. I'm just giving the executive summary, stability. But there's a problem here. The problem is stability is version n plus 1 benefit. It's a down the road benefit. It's not the current version. It's the next version. The next version of that, you're going to benefit from it. So if I'm tasked with doing a 1.0 version of a system, I don't care about maintainability. I'm, I'm working on it for the first time, no maintainability. I don't care about reuse. I have to do it anyway. I don't care about extending it. I'm doing it. This is it. Now here lies a problem. Suppose you have a manager responsible for doing 1.0 of a system with a highly aggressive schedule, constrained budgets. The whole problem is, you know, that somebody's got a boot on the manager's neck. I mean, the whole thing is horrible. What they're going to be tempted to do is say, look, this whole stability thing, that's wonderful, but in our case, you know, it's a luxury. Let's not do it. I mean, meet the deadline is the number one priority. And they would simply not do a design or a good design. For them, it's a wasted investment. It doesn't move them closer to the schedule and the budget goals. Now, that's, of course, a mistake, because the reality is that if you don't spend the time doing this, and you have a tightly coupled design, you have a tightly coupled team, there is no way you can actually meet the deadline. Conversely, the only way of meeting an aggressive deadline is by having a world-class design, even if you don't care about version 2.0, N plus 1, whatever it is. And if one in a million manager will, will know that. But the only handle on the schedule you have is a world-class design. So when you staff a project, the first thing you need to do, you get an architect. Now, the architect doesn't work in isolation. The architect needs a product manager and a project manager. I call those that triumvirat the core team. Now, the first thing you do, you get a project manager, a product manager, and an architect. Now, these are logical roles. You may have the architect and the project manager be the same person, or maybe you have three product managers. Conceptually, let's assume it's three. And so you get the core team in place. You don't need developers yet. Why do you need a core team in place on day one? The architect does that. We know that. What does the product manager do? He or she needs to own the customer, to be a proxy to the customer, to encapsulate the customers. Customers create an enormous amount of noise. And you constantly have to milk requirements out of them and polish them and do another demo. And if you let the architect also be the one chasing the requirements, you won't get any design done. The, product man the project manager shields the team from the organization. Most organizations can create way too much noise, and the noise comes back into the organization and, and saturates the team, preventing them from doing any work. Nobody from outside the team should actually see anything besides the facade of the project manager. And so the core team in place is now gathering the requirements, analyzing them, doing the top-level architecture. Up until the architecture is done, there is no point in getting developers. How long will it take? Your mileage will vary. My experience is about 20% of the duration of the project. So on a one-year project, we're looking at two or three months to do it. Only after you have the decomposition done, and we'll see why later on, can you answer two simple questions. How long will it take and how much it will cost? Any attempt to do it before is nonsense. It's a guess. You want to get good numbers? You have to get the decomposition and the architecture first. At this point, what you do, you call a meeting. The official name would be the Project Development uh, Plan Review. Between you and me, it's the feed me or kill me point. And you write a glossy, nice document around those two numbers. It's A slash B. That's only the two numbers you care about. And you say to the top level management, look, here's how long it will take and how much it will cost. If you don't like it, kill it now. And if you think about it, it's a good idea to kill the project now. If the numbers are what, not what the organization is willing to spend, so what? Three guys working for two or three months, it's nothing. It's a lot, hell of a lot better than waiting two or three years. And then after a bunch of developers and testers working on it, then we kill the project. You know, it was too expensive. All that money is now flushed down the toilet. It's horrible. If this is not what you want, kill it now. It's also good for your career because you're not working on a failed project. You don't get ahead in life because of effort. You get compensated because of results. And if you're successfully on project or get canceled, you know, at the end of the day, it's not good for you. So 
kill it now. On the other hand, if you're okay with those numbers, here's a little sign-off sheet that says, here's how long it will take, how much it will cost, sign it. That's your insurance policy. Purely from a close quarter combat standpoint, it's essential that the top level manager will sign the policy. Why? They're simply unlikely to cancel it. As long as you stay within those parameters, and I'll show you how to stay within those parameters, they would look not that smart to their managers if they cancel you. So what? A year later, they're still within those two numbers, but you now decide it's not okay? You cancel them? No, they're much more likely to go and cancel some other project that doesn't have an insurance policy. They just look better, right? Project is approved, you start staffing with developers. We see exactly how many developers you need and how long. You add testers. At some point, the project is fully staffed. At some point, you start phasing out developers and testers. You don't need all of them. You always strive to have the smallest possible team on hand. Why? To increase efficiency. The life cycle I advocate you should plan against is the stage delivery. Stage delivery recognizes two sad facts. Any moment in time, you could be out of money, out of budget, or both. Stage delivery recognizes also the fact that people don't trust you. The reason the customer and the manager give you impossible deadline is because they just don't trust you. They know you're going to be late. So if the customer needs the product in October, are they going to say to you October? No, they're going to say August. When your manager hears August, you're going to say, oh, you're going to say June. By the time it gets to you, it's, it's April. You have two months to finish the project. There is no way you can do it. And only because they don't trust you. What the stage delivery does, it looks like this. You do some upfront preparation where you gather the requirements, analyze them, top level design, and all that. It looks kind of like a waterfall. But then you go into a successive set of stages. At the end of each stage, you check out and you release. And you do another stage, check out and release. Now, what's the advantage of structuring it like this? First, if you get canceled mid-stage here, it's not a binary total loss. In the classic waterfall, where you wait for the whole thing and you get canceled the day before you release, the whole thing is lost. In general, I prefer to have something than nothing. I'd rather have everything, but if I can't have everything, something is better than nothing. So if I get canceled between stage three and stage four, you know what? I don't get four, but at least I get all the work that was done here. It's insured, it's deployed. And so that accommodates the fact that at moment in, any moment in time, especially in this economy, you can be out of money, or out of time, or both. The other thing it lets you do is negotiate better terms. Customer says August. You say, well, we, we can try this all or nothing approach to August, but here's what we'll do. We'll give you some of it in February, another subsystem in April, another more of it in August, and some of it in October, and some of it in the following January. From the customer perspective, customer says, look, I'll get to see what they're working on very early on, give them feedback. It's always good to get customer feedback early on. Plus, if they're going to be late, I'll know about it almost a year in advance. Okay. It's a far better negotiation tool, and it reduces the risk. Arguably, the more stages you have, the better off you are. In fact, here's a project. This is a project I managed in the past. This is a project from one of the iDesign customers. You see here in blue, releases to the outside customer, the real customer. But you see that this project had internal stages nobody actually knew about from the outside world. It's excellent to do it this way, too. Next, once you have the decomposition done, you need to decide how you're going to integrate the various modules and the services. How do you do it? You draw, um, so first of all, let's talk about what not to do. The thing that you must at all cost avoid is a big bang integration attempt. What's that? You have a bunch of developers that worked on a bunch of modules, a bunch of services. You bring them all together, and you expect the whole thing to work. It's never going to work. Do you know why? Because we're humans, and as humans, there's always going to be a discrepancy between what you thought you're going to end up with and what you actually ended up with. If you let these idiosyncrasies survive to the system level, the inherent complexity of the system, regardless of what you're trying to do, the issues with security and transaction, remote call, the activation, the hosting, the timeout, all of that superimposed on the integration issue would mean there is no way you can integrate it. It requires superhuman effort to do it. So instead of doing it as late as possible, which is at the end, you do it as soon as possible. As soon as you can integrate two things, of course, two is a bare minimum for integration, maybe it's going to be three, you integrate them. Any discrepancy, you fix it at that point. How do you know the order in which you integrate? You draw a dependency graph first. Dependency graph shows which module requires which other module. If you did your work right, there's no uh, cyclic dependency here. Right? So you end up with some kind of a tree. If it's a tree, it's going to have leaves. So 
always assign developers to the leaves first, and you're kind of chewing from the bottom up, up your dependency chart. So it may look like this. And again, all chart, let's stop, stop saying it, all chart, everything is real life. Here we have a project. We can see some kind of a dependency tree. We see that these two were integrated, and then this integration point we integrated with this guy, and so on, you keep chewing up this way. If you have enough firepower, you can start chewing on the integration chart from various directions. You can see this project on January 12th, this was integrated. This was integrated on January 13th, but then it was shelved and three months later integrated to the system. Okay? Now, there's a problem doing it this way. And the problem is, or well, it's a risk for you, that as you start integrating these modules, the modules themselves fundamentally do not do anything. We discussed yesterday why never to do a functional decomposition. As the aggregate of the system will expose the functionality, not the individual modules. Right? We said, you know, you do the cooking first, you're toast. Right? And so the problem is, if you integrate this service with that service, do you see any features? No. You integrate this with that. Do you see any features? No. And you keep doing the integration. And at some point, you've integrated enough that you start seeing features. I call a point in time the system. The system may not be the last integration step. You may have many more steps after it. The problem is the system point comes into being far later in the life cycle of the project, many months sometimes. And the problem we have here is managers. Managers do not understand this. They don't understand that functional decomposition is bad. And you have to understand the mind of the manager. Managers are like sharks. They swim in the organization looking for sick projects to kill. <laughs> Hence my statement that this is the manager's salute. <laughs> now, what's the problem with that? The problem is how do they know a project is sick or not? Simple, progress. You don't see any progress, they assume it's sick, let's kill it. And absolutely correct, I'd rather kill a project when it's still young and sick, not when it's old and sick. Right? It makes perfect sense. The problem here, you're going to be showing them features and functions, uh, you know, months later. Not good. So instead, you flip it. What you do is, instead of basing your milestones on features, and in this particular interaction diagram, you're going to have one giant milestone at the end. Here's the system, right? Never base your milestone on features. Always base your milestones on integration points. The thing is, in this kind of a schema, you now have many, many integration points, and they're all granular, and that gives you the option of having a continuous stream of good news coming out of this project. Here's another project from uh, one of the Edison customers. Next question you have to answer is, OK, I know the dependency. What is the order in which I'm actually going to do it? Should I do these two first, or these two first? Should I do this one, or this one, or this one? How does it work? So you look at the whole long list of all the modules that you have. You have a long list of all the modules, the services, and everything else. You estimate the effort involved in doing each. We'll discuss estimation and tracking later on. It doesn't have to be a perfect estimation. I'll show you a mechanism that constantly corrects itself. So you have some kind of an estimation. Now you need to answer a question. How long will it take to implement this system, and how much it will cost? Answering that question is not a simple matter of multiplying seven developers by a year or whatever it is. The only way to answer that question in a highly modular environment is recursively. Here's how I would answer the question. Suppose this is my independency chart. How long will it take me to get to 18? Well, it's a time it would take me to implement 18 plus the time it took me to do 17. OK, how long it took me to do 17? Well, the time it took me to implement 17 plus the max between 2 and 16. How long it took me to do? Obviously, this is going to be less. How long did you to do 16? Well, 16, 11, 11. Well, 11 between the maximum this, guy, this guy. Okay? So you keep answering this in a regression recursive manner. What you strive to discover is the critical pass of integration. The critical pass of integration is the longest pass in your integration chart. Put differently, the critical pass is the quickest possible way known to men to build this system. No system can ever be accelerated beyond its critical path. Think about it. If we assign developers to services in a one-to-one -one manner, 
You give me more developers and there's nothing to do. I'm working on the things that I have to do. Once you identify the critical paths, now you start discussing the order in which you're going to be doing things. The first thing you have to observe is two things. You always assign to the critical paths first. That's where your risk is. Doing things fast outside the critical path does not accelerate the project. Slowing down the critical path definitely slows down the project. Take it a step further. Best developers always go to the critical path. It doesn't matter if the guy likes to do this. It doesn't matter. You're doing this. You're going to deliver on time. I trust you on that one. So let's look at this integration plan. Day one of this project, how many developers you would need? Give me a number. One. Two. No. OK. One is incorrect. Two is also incorrect. Incorrect. Well, zero is a bit tricky. <laughs> the answer is at most two. Think about it. You're giving one developer, which would we assign it? Where would it be? Three, right? You gave me two, I'll give it to number two. You give me three, the guy's playing foosball. There's nothing to do. You give me five, three are going to be playing foosball, reading blogs. There's nothing to do. Okay. Once three is done, how many developers would I need? Five, four, six. You got it almost right. Almost? At most six. Think of it. Suppose I did one developer number three. Three is done. It opens up all of this. So I could actually employ one, two, three, four, five, six developers. So the answer is at most six. Now, it's probably not a good idea to employ six even at that point. Remember, you always want to keep the team the smallest possible way that increases the efficiency and reduces the cost. Even developers that play foosball, you pay for them, right? And so if I'm employing six, and let's suppose this whole thing takes more or less the same time, by the time we get here, I only can employ four. I don't want to employ six. Maybe I'll assign four here, or maybe five. By the time we're done here, I'll let the fifth guy do number two. I don't know what it is. Every project is different. But that's how you answer the question. And that's how you build a staffing distribution chart. The only way to answer the question, how much it will cost, is the integral of the staffing distribution. Basically, the sum of those bars. You can also see that at some point, the bulk of the integration is mostly done. You start phasing off developers. By doing this slow ramp up and phasing off, you avoid feast and famine cycles. Most projects, it's a feast or famine, right? Everybody's working overtime and weekend or playing foosball, right? There's nothing in between. Here's another integration plan from another uh, project. You can see that even though it was anthropology wise symmetric, there is clearly a path which is uh, more critical than the other. What is a life cycle? I advocate for the service uh, uh, itself. And that's an interesting point I'm going to show you next. Remember that the name of uh, uh, the game here is to have a modular architecture. What you're trying to do is reduce the inherent degree of complexity in the system. Right? So if I go back to this diagram here, this system is inherently complex regardless of what it is you're trying to do. Just the complexity of the glue and the hosting and the components and the activation and everything else. What I found out is that the only fighting chance you have at the system level is if the individual modules are themselves rock solid. Doesn't mean you're going to succeed, it just gives you a fighting chance. If you have, on top of system level issues, individual module issues, all hope is lost. So how do you get rock solid modules? Well, we've answered that question for many years now. We have proven methodologies of how to get rock solid quality at the system level. The next quantum leap of faith is, let's apply the same things at the scope of a service. So what I suggested you is you follow a life cycle for the individual service, which is in many ways reminiscent of what you should do for an entire system, except accelerated. Every service starts with a requirement spec. I'm not necessarily talking about a 225-page laborious document here. 
a paragraph, two paragraphs about what this service is supposed to do. If the developer cannot write a page on what he or she is required to do, let me tell you they do not understand what they need to do. You review the requirements, and at that point, you do two things. The first thing you do is a test plan. Most developers completely miss the point of the purpose of testing. And I'll prove it to you. What is the purpose of testing? Anybody? What? To eliminate bugs. Incorrect. What, what, what? Catch a problem early. Incorrect. What was that? Meet the requirement. Incorrect. Validation. No, 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 no. Stop. You might as well just stop. Stop. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> let's, let's pick every one of these things you said. They're basically a variation of your attempt to prove that it meets the requirement or prove that it works. Right? That's basically all this, the statement you made. By the way, can you prove that something works? You can mathematically prove that you cannot prove that something works. You agree? Halting problem and all of that, right? Why are trying to do it? It's impossible. The only purpose of testing is to prove it doesn't work. Interesting, isn't it? None of you got it right. I'm now convinced that most developers do testing because it makes them feel good. <laughs> now, to add insult to injury here, most developers do testing against the end product, against the end service, the end module. At which point, what they do is they test that it does what it does. There's no bugs that it does what it does. I don't care that it does what it does. I care that it doesn't do what it should have done. Isn't that a better statement? To make it even worse, when developers do testing against the service or the module, they've already developed some emotional attachment to it. It's not a piece of code, it's their baby. <laughs> oh, it's a little piece of code, oh, it's a little piece of eye, oh, take it, oh, look at it, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> the more eye, oh, beautiful thing. That's not testing. Testing has to have a maniacal mindset. I hate it! I hate it, 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 I hate it! What will it take to break it? That is the mindset you need for testing. And and sadly And sadly most developers lack that at the point that it's a baby. So here's what you do. As soon as you're done with the requirement, you ask them, write for me some test plans. Show me how you're gonna prove to me that this doesn't work. Once you're done with that, you can also do some construction. Note, I'm saying requirements, construction. At which point all the process purists shriek in horror and they say, you call yourself I design, where's design? I can go from requirement to construction. Hold on, I didn't say construction, I said some construction. And here's the problem. If I look at other engineering disciplines, hardly anybody goes straight from requirement to manufacturing. When Ford is, is building a new car, do they go straight from blueprints, AutoCAD, to manufacturing? Or there's maybe a concept car with clay and plywood and... I mean, you can't drive a plywood car, but you can see if, you know, enough elbow room, see if it looks good. And would the architect go straight from the blueprints to the building? No, we build a cardboard mock-up with plastic trees. You can't live in a plastic uh, house. But it lets me some options as to what is going on. Everybody is doing it. And when the article engineer is building some kind of uh, thing, they put it in the wind tunnel to see what it looks like. Now, the problem in this very vastly shifting landscape, developers are always at odds as to what is going on and the technology at hand. They have to gain insight into the nature of the problem. Maybe DoubleSafe is already doing 90% of what you're trying to do. Who knows? Developers gain insight by getting their hands dirty. All engineers do it, by the way. You do some construction, this is not production code. You're gonna throw it away, it's just to get an insight. When you get the insight, you do little design. After that, you go for little design review. And after that, you do construction. But you don't just write the code. On the side, you constantly write a test client. The word testing is a bit misleading. It's not unit testing, it's a construction facility. 
you must have 100% coverage. In fact, it's many thousands of percent coverage. Every line of code must be walked over with a debugger. It's the best way of eliminating issues at the module level. The module has to be rock solid. You write a line of code, you put a button to step over here. A line of code here, another button, a checkbox here. Once you're done with construction, you go to code review, and then you go into unit testing and integration with the rest of the system. Next area of the process on our list is estimation and tracking. We don't have a crystal ball. Would be nice, but we don't. What do we do instead? We estimate. No estimation is going to be perfect, ever. You have to have a way of constantly calibrating your estimation. And that's an important point. Most people, even if they have a feed me or kill me point against a kind of a plan, once a project is signed on, they take the plan, put it in a drawer. No. A project plan is a live entity. The day you stop planning this project is five minutes before you release it, even then you were just tweaking some last minute parameters. You constantly plan and replan and plan and replan, which means you have to close the loop. You have to have a way of planning and then tracking against the plan and refining your estimation and keep doing it. The first thing we have to discuss therefore is estimation. The first observation I'm going to share with you is that if you're using technology like SOAR or WCF, it will not take any faster than if you weren't using it. Which sounds strange. I mean, go to any keynote here at TechEd, and for years they're showing these demos where the VP is dropping a control and click, 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 and six clicks they would do a full, full pledge enterprise application. You should be wondering about those demos, right? <laughs> the reality is that no technology can ever accelerate schedule. Here's why. If you look at all the things you need to do, let's look at it just as logical activities in your project. You have to gather the requirements, analyze them, top-level design, data design, implementation, testing, integration, documentation, deployment, sample code. Do you agree that if you omit any of the things I just said, you will fail? Yes. Good. Out of that sequence, what percentage of time was spent banging on the keyboard, typing the code? Give me a number. No, 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 80% you already failed. <laughs> on well-managed projects that were on schedule, on budget, on quality, the number is between 20 and 30%. It's fairly constant. On really, really good projects, it's 10%. That's all you really spend. The developer may be staring at Visual Studio for longer than time than that, but we know developers only write three lines of code a day, right? We know that. It's been proven. Now, suppose you spend 30% of the cycle on actually coding. And suppose you move to .NET 4.0 and it's twice as productive as .NET 3.0, which was twice as productive as 3.0 and 2.0 and so on, right? Obviously, it can't be keep compounding forever like those certain keynote demos pretend, right? But let's just take them at their word. Suppose you accelerate it by a factor of 100%. So you move it from 30% to 15%. So yes, you improve it by 100%, but overall the marginal improvement is 15%. Lump against that learning curve, at best you're where you started. No technology can ever accelerate schedule. Which begs the question, what do we even bother, right? <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because they give us a handle on an increased degree of complexity. The reality is that V plus one, whichever application you do for a living, is always more complex. If you look at application from 10 years ago, by now it's the same line of business, but 10 years ago nobody cared about the web and things were standalone. Now it's all single sign-on federated in the cloud and support scalability. It's the same, the same application, you're just counting this, moving in, sorting this, storing it there. It's still the same stuff, but the degree of complexity is mind-boggling. The only fighting chance you have against the increased degree of complexity is to use better tools and framework. In fact, you're always at a disadvantage because you always try to build tomorrow's application using today's tools. Microsoft and every other vendor, they're only playing catch up to what we are already doing. And by the time they call up, we're doing something else. That's the reality. What this means is that your legacy matters. When you estimate the effort, if it took a year to do it in uh, Chrome, it took a year to do it in .NET. If it took a year in .NET, it took a year in WCF. It took a year in WCF, it took a year in the cloud. Well, you know, give and take in both strokes. Your legacy is very important when you estimate uh, effort. Another thing I recommend when you do estimation is use tools. 
There's quite a few tools that look at a historical database of projects and correlate based on some parameters, team size, languages, uh, estimated number of screens, number of lines of code, and give you some kind of a correlation to that. It's very important to involve the team members actively in the estimation. A bad estimation looks like this. You have two weeks. <laughs> Why this is bad? It's bad because whoever you just dropped it on doesn't feel accountable for it. It wasn't his two weeks, it was your two weeks. Right? A far better question is how long it will take. Now, when they tell you how long it will take, they typically only look at the act of typing it. You say, really, does this include sitting on uh, design review and code review of your staff plus design review, code review, review of every other developer in the team, and writing the test client, and documenting it, and uh, learning WCF or Civilite or whatever? Does it include it? Ah, uh, no. So there is only one answer you will ever be willing to accept as an answer to your question of how long it will take. And you also give this answer upstairs. So if somebody asks you how long it will take, you give the same answer. The answer is, let me get back to you. They ask you, say, let me get back to you. And you go and you estimate on the side. And when the developer comes to you and says, two weeks, no, 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 no. I want you to go back and estimate all these things, then come back to me. OK? It's very important to understand that both underestimating and overestimating a project is a sure way of killing it. Overestimating is quite common. It's basically padding. Developer says it's going to take two weeks. Are you going to plan for two weeks? No, you're going to say three. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that if you give a developer three weeks for a task that should have taken two weeks, they're not going to stop after two weeks. They're going to work in for three weeks. What they're going to do in the remaining week, they're going to add complexity and increase the complexity. You're doing everything you can to reduce complexity, do all of that, and then you give time pe people to add complexity and bells and whistles and features that nobody needs. Okay? Typically, usually expense of core functionality. Let's look at Visual Studio 2010. Horrible performance, but with a WPF editor. I'm, but I digress. <laughs> so, much the same way, um, you don't want to give too aggressive schedules because if you give for a task that you've taken two weeks, you give them two days, the probability of success is about zero. But they're still going to try. How are they going to try? They're going to cut every possible corner. There is no quick and dirty. It's just dirty. Okay? You're guaranteeing the dirty portion. So it's very important that your estimate will be more or less nominal. So you take all the list of activities and everything you do in your project, and you estimate all the activities for the services. Now, remember from the integration chart, we identified the critical paths based on the estimation. From our available resources, we know the order in which we're going to do it. Right? Next, you have to ask yourself a simple question. Does the plan make sense or not? So here's, say, all the activities I have in the project. Some of it are truly related to modules or services. Some of it more amorphous, like architecture or system testing. And I can estimate the effort involved in every one of them. I sum it all up. I know the overall effort for this project. Now, let's look, say, at the user interface activity. It's 40 days. What is 40 out of 200? 20%. Put differently, once I'm done with the user interface, I have earned 20% towards the completion of this project. Now, from the dependency chart, I also know the date by which I'm going to be done with it. So I can actually also plot now how I plan to earn value as time goes by in this project. And I would plot this. Now, the problem that I have at this point is that while I know the order in which I'm going to be doing it and the duration, these are funny days. They're not corresponding to calendar day. At this point, I bring up MS Project and I convert 40 calendar days to days and start do stop days, and the guy goes to take it for a week, and weekends in between, and everything else. That's the only thing MS Project is very good at. It absolutely excels as an elaborate scheduler, but that's all it is. It's not a planning tool, it's a scheduler. Once you get the actual dates, you can toss MS Project. You don't need it anymore. Now, the knuckle draggers would require it, so keep it, but you know what I mean. So now you do how you plan 
to n value as a function of time in this project. Now, what it lets you do is you look at the plan and you see if the plan makes sense or not. Why? Because if you think about it, the pitch of that curve is the throughput of your team. Now, suppose the plan looks like this. What is going on here? We were chugging along, and then this. What is the productivity miracle that happened here? Do you think this is a realistic plan? And this is typically the result of back scheduling. What's that? You understand the dependency between the task and everything else. And you start doing things properly, and you start with the core team, and you have another developer for doing component number three, and then you have two more for number four, and so on. You kind of like chug along. But there's also a, a stake in the ground we have to release by this date. You're saying, oh my god, we got to release. You take all the other activities, ram it against the schedule, that's the plan. Do you think it's going to succeed? This is a screenshot of a customer of mine from April. So I was doing a design review of what they did, and things didn't look right based on what I saw in the MS project, by the way, in the Gantt chart. So you know what? It would take me only a few minutes to just do this, item some numbers, and I did this chart. Do you think this project is on its way to success? Could any team pull so many Gs here? <laughs> I mean, look, if this represents the support of the team, I don't care which team it is, if they, then they cannot do this. Do you agree? And what goes on here? What is this, infinite productivity? Much the same way you can detect the opposite, which is just as bad, unrealistically pessimistic plan. We're doing so great, and then this? What happened? Did the plague hit my team? <laughs> okay. Now, we know that the pitch of the curve is the throughput of the team. Between you and me, as a top-level manager, you have a way of now comparing, in a qualitative manner, two teams. But, obviously, if the team size is fixed in size, it should yield a straight line because the pitch represents the throughput of the team. You agree? Good. But the one thing I told you is don't keep the team size fixed. So what would a well-designed project look like? Not my terminology. The architect must design not just the artifacts, the modules and such, but also the project. The architect is the only person capable of doing that. You have to design the project. So a well-designed project yields a shallow S. Why shallow S? Because at the beginning, the core team is in place, you know, two, three guys working on it, not a big deal. The feed me cumulative point happens here, you start ramping up with resources. At some point, the project is fully staffed, you do get a straight line, and then, as you're done with the core set of services, you're done with most of the integration, you start phasing off resources away, you do more system testing, you release. Now, the plan is the way we looked at it so far, so far was by this date, I'm done. I've earned 100% of the value of this project. But there's another thing you can glean out of this chart, which is by this date, I should have also spent 100% of my effort, what the scum guy called the burn through and such. Now, you have to manage both elements here. Staying within budget, but 100% over schedule, we agree is a form of failure, right? You stay within budget, instead of a year, it took you two years. Not good. But you know what? It's exactly the same as meeting the deadline 200% of a budget. It's another form of failure. And you have to manage both. So by this date, I should have spent 100% of the effort and have earned 100% of the value, and I'm 100% down as far as progress. It's another way of looking at the same chart. So next, you need, that is the plan. That's your project plan. Cross all modules and phases and activities, of course. That is the plan. Good. Insidious things is modules. But I told you the plan is just an, an estimation. How do you know where you are? And the problem is, most managers at this point will resort, result, uh, resolve to what I'm calling the communal lie. You sit there in a staff meeting and Joe manager is saying, we are 60% done. Really? Where is that coming from? You had it in your gut? The two sphere left you a note at 60%? Where is that number coming from? 
And the problem with most managers is how do they know where they are? Cost services, cost developers, cost versus phases of completion. Remember the life cycle we do for every service. How do you know where you are? I'm harboring a suspicion that most managers in their hearts of heart always gravitate towards the waterfall precisely because of this point. Because the waterfall is fundamentally contractual. We do this, across everybody, then we do that, then we do this. There's clear exit criteria for everything. We can manage it, we can track it, we can plan it. It doesn't work in real life, but that's what they do. In the hearts of heart, all managers want to do a waterfall. How many of you agree with that statement? Mm, yes. And so the problem is compounded here because of the highly fractured modular nature of your design and the assignment of the resources against the services. To make it even worse, you cannot go and ask a developer where he or she is. Because whenever you ask a developer where, where he or she is, 90% of the time, they're going to be 90% done. <laughs> you ask them, are you done? Yes, I'm almost done. I still have to do this, but I'm done. I'm done. Good. You come a week later, you're done. Yeah, I thought I was done, but then I realized he didn't do that. As soon as he didn't do that, I'm, I'll be done. Good. You come a week later, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. I already started working on the other thing. I'm not, as soon as that, I'll, I'll go and... Uh... How can you track it? You have to establish binary exit criteria at the service subphase level. What does it mean? We know that you do this life cycle for each module. Now, each of the phases in the life cycle, I also showed you an exit criteria out of it. Look at it. What is the exit criteria for requirements? Requirement review. And exit criteria for design, design review. And for code, code review. So these are more than reviews. These are exit criteria. And how do I know you are done with coding? It's not because you told me you're done. It's because we scheduled a code review and you passed the code review. Now you are done. I don't care if the code is done. If you have done the review, then it's not done. So either done or it's not done at the phase level. Next, what you do is you assign weight for the individual phases. So here we have, say, again, the user interface activities. And suppose I have the regular phases, requirement, design, testing, construction, and such. You have to assign a weight for each phase. Now, if you have five phases, you can say they're all 20% each. Or you could say, well, with user interface requirements, it's 50%. It's very important. Or you could say, um, we always give uh, a requirement 30% across all our modules. So we can do it by the number of phases, by the type of the activity, by the type of the phase. None of it actually matters. Choose the simplest one, which is the number of phases. That's how I do it now. I tried all three. Things will simply cancel each other out. And number of phases is literally the simplest way of doing it. Other way of doing it is just assigning what we're going to work in for 20 days, and this is 40 days, this is 10 days. Then you would actually have the weighting implicitly done for you. But you have some kind of weighting for the activity. Now suppose in this particular activity, you're done with requirement, little design and testing, but you haven't done construction and documentation. So 15 plus 20 plus 10 is 45%. So you're 45% done in this module. Now, we also had this view of the various activities where we estimated the contribution of that for the overall completion. And in case of the user interface, it was 20%. If the user interface is 45% done, 45% of 20% is 9%. You sum it all up across all services and modules and activities, and now you know where you are. Cost developers, cost services, cost phases of completion. But this is today. Let's do it a week from now, and two weeks from now, and three weeks from now. And let's compare it to the plan. And that's how you track it. Next, what you can do is simply start uh, plotting it. This is a project from my past. You can see here three quarters of a shell OS. I started checking it like this after the feed me or kill me point, but you can certainly do it even in the feed me or kill me point. We can see the three quarters of the shell OS. We can see here in green the progress, and in red the effort. How do you track effort? Simple. Somebody came to work for five days. You consumed five days. Doesn't matter if they haven't done anything. Effort is independent of progress. Suppose the task was estimated as 10 days, two weeks of work. It's quite possible after three weeks, you're 150% on effort, but only 70% on progress. There are two independent variables. So tracking progress is one thing, 0, 1, 0, 1. Tracking effort is another. 
Now, next thing that you do, well, here's from uh, one of the uh, design customers. By the way, note that because of the binary exit criteria, these lines are actually a step function. Because of, at this point, you get all the end value of that particular thing. It's released at once, so you get this jump. It's a step function. Now, arguably, the more phases you have, the more services, the bigger the project, the smaller the incremental jump, and so the graph gets a lot smoother, and at some point it gets completely smooth. You don't even see the individual jump. This is why it doesn't really matter if it's 20%, 27%, 25%. It doesn't matter. It will cancel each other out across all the phases and everything else. Now, what do you do with it next? Next, you want to see where you're going. And so, suppose this is my project plan. Let's, for simplicity's sake, assume it's a straight line. I know it's a shallow S, but it's, it's going to be easier to, to explain on the straight line. In blue, I see my plan. In green, I see my progress. In red, I see the effort. Now, in this particular project, this project was planned to be done here and consume all its budget. And I'm using the term budget not in terms of dollars, but in terms of time, the time you wanted to spend on it. When will this project be done? Well, let's look at the progress. The progress, I can extrapolate. So I'm right-clicking Excel, right-click, extrapolate. And I see a trend line. Well, this project will be done, not at this date, it will be done at this date once the green line reaches 100%. The green line represents your team. The blue line represents the plan. The green line is highly calibrated for the throughput of your team. Not some make-believe, wishful thinking. Your team. This project will be done when the green line reaches 100%. You will find resistance for the truth. You are going to present this to your manager, and the manager will retort by saying, but I really wanted the blue line. Think about it. What you wished for, what you wanted, has no bearing on reality. Reality is what you're going to get. You're going to get the green line. You're not going to get the blue line. <laughs> and like I said, you can find resistance for the truth. Much the same way, you can extrapolate the effort and see by this date where you're going to be. Now, since it only takes three or four points to get a decent regression going on, on a, say, a one-year project, if we do it on a weekly basis, that means a month into this project, you already know exactly where this project is going, and you start applying corrective measures early on. We still have time to have them be effective. Right? So here's a project from my past. You can see, of course, all services and modules and everything else. This project is about two-thirds into the project, projected to have about a month's schedule sleep and about 8% cost overrun. What do you do next? You mechanize it. So you go to my laptop here, you take up Excel. And you start listing all the various activities you have in the project. Activity one, activity two, activity three, lots of activities. For every activity, you have the individual phases in that activity. Now, you can actually estimate this is going to be three days, five days, whatever, and the spreadsheet will automatically calculate the relative weight, or you can actually do it by assigning the weight, whatever you like. Obviously, it should all end up at 100%. So you have the breakdown of the various modules. For each module, you have the estimation. For each module, you have the various phases and the estimated effort for each. You go to MS project, and for every one of the, oh, now you go to the dependency chart. Dependency chart, you identify the critical path. From the critical path, you identify the order in which you're going to do it. Now you go to MS project, and you get dates. You take the dates, and you plug it in this worksheet. You're saying, look, activity one is estimated at having this much effort, should be done by this date, by this date, by this date, by this date. The spreadsheet will automatically calculate for you the earned value up to this point. You know what this is? This is the blue line. Then you go into reporting. Every week, Friday afternoon, you sit there and you look at each activity. Now remember, we're talking about relatively small teams, seven developers, or seven individuals if you want to include even testers. It's not a big deal to look at all the activities that were done this week and say, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 on everything that you did. We did code review? One. We didn't? not changing it. You also give the effort that was done against each. Joe came to work for five days, we consumed five days, irrespective of everything else. The spreadsheet at this point 
would calculate for you the earned value up to this point and even the effort spent up to this point. And make no mistake about it, this is a spreadsheet from hell. I'm very, very good at Excel. It took me like three days to work on it, okay? But what do you care? It's already done. So this is the green line, and this is the red line. And of course, the spreadsheet would also plot it for you. I'm such a nice guy, we'll even do the extrapolation for you. Okay? There's really nothing to it. Now, it, the bulk of the effort is done here up front, designing the system, decomposing it properly, analyzing the dependencies, estimating the effort, assigning the resources, building the end value charts. But once all that is done, how long will it take you to say 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 is unplot? Every project I ever managed, I was always within 2.5% of the initial uh, cost and schedule. And I'll show you in a second how you can do it. You know, the literature will tell you if you're within 5%, you're like God. There was no divine intervention. There was just a dedicated, mechanized approach for solving this problem. And it, you become a two-minute project manager at this point, if this is what you want to do. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, you're done. A status meeting is not you asking the developers, where are you? A status meeting is you telling the developers where they are. You are 65% done. You should have been 80 by now. Anything I need to know about? Need some help? Maybe this, maybe that? Now, what do you do with information next? Next, you mechanize even the act of deciding. Those who attended the ideas on method knows that I like to give you the questions, but even the answers. So let's also talk about the symptoms. What do they mean, and what can we glean out of it? So we'll go a few minutes over time. Is that okay? Suppose it looks like this. Now, obviously, when you do these kind of projections, right, you need to also take corrective actions to make sure the lines converge, because you want them to converge. Right? Put differently, the mission in life of a project manager is to make those three lines converge. Nothing else matters. And it's my statement that this is the project manager's salute. <laughs> right? So architects do this, managers do this, project managers do this. Right? So suppose it's like this. What does it tell you is going on in this project? It tells you life is good. And consequently, what should you do? Nothing. Go home right now. In fact, if you were to do anything, you're going to disturb it. Don't tinker with it. Don't tweak it. Don't try and improve. Don't try and help. Don't do anything. Go home. You will do more for the success of this project than anything else. <laughs> knowing not to do is just as important as knowing to do something. How many times you had managers, you know, are trying to help and just derail the whole thing, right? Don't do anything. The problem is this is unlikely to actually happen on its own accord because Software project systems are fundamentally chaotic systems with giant butterfly effects. You know, you move one semicolon here and the whole team goes catatonic over there, right? <laughs> it's a butterfly effect. You know, chaotic systems don't behave like this. You agree? So it's unlikely to get there on its own accord. What if it's like this? Progress is under the plan, effort is above the plan. What's going on in this project? What was that? Yes, you underestimated. What are you going to do about it? It depends. There's a number of corrective action to take here. In a project that is fundamentally day-driven, there's a stake in the ground, you have to ship it, the marketing guys have already sold it to the customer. You have to be 100% here, and that's it. Here's what you can do. You start tossing things overboard. We're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, we're not moving into this stage and that stage from over there. You start tossing things overboard. By tossing things overboard, the earned value of what you did so far, cost module, cost developers, cost whatever you want to cost, will count more. The green line will go up to meet the blue line. And you keep tossing and keep tossing until you meet the blue line. Every time they say, but I really want that too. Well, you want the blue line or not? <laughs> toss, 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 toss. Okay? Now, in a feature-driven project, you can't do it. In a feature-driven project, what you do, you say, look, we still got to do all these things to replace the competitors or whatever. Then you push the schedule further away. By doing so, the blue line will go down to meet the green line. The green line is what your team is producing. You can't argue with reality here. 
What's another way of possibly fixing this project? Add more people. Add more people. That would be the average management one-on-one -on -one approach. <laughs> so let's, let's assume we're adding more people here. Okay? This is the extrapolation line. We're actually here. We're adding more people. In theory, the throughput of the team would improve. So now the green line will go up. What would happen to the red line? Go to the stratosphere. Since one is fixing one thing by further breaking another, a good idea. But if you were to actually add people, what you will find is that the red line, as expected, go up, and the green line, as unexpected, goes down. Why? Because you add new people to a project that is already a pressure cooker here. The new guy doesn't know anything, doesn't understand your design, doesn't know anything. What is he going to do? They can go to somebody who does know and pull by the sleeve and say, you go, okay, I'm just with a network share because I couldn't find a network share and it didn't let me actually get it and I got the file and it actually didn't have the connection there. As a good team member, what are you going to do? You're going to drop whatever you're going to do and go and help the other guy. What happens to your productivity? So, progress will go down, effort will go up. Adding resources to a late project is a sure way of killing it. Let's not even talk about what happens to the overall efficiency inside that team, right? Because of the increased communication overhead. You can only get away fairly close to the axis here. If you are fairly close to the axis, these are the first three, four, five measurement points, and you see you are grossly understaffed here, first of all, you have a case to go to manager and say, give me more X, because you can even show the numbers. And second, if you have people right now, everybody's going to be more or less on the same clueless footing. You can actually get by. You're close to the axis here, close to the origin. What is going on in this project? Progress is under the plan, effort is above the progress, but under the plan. You're not overestimating. I would expect the progress to be above the plan if I were overestimating. What, what, what? The are enjoying their life. Uh, but then I would expect effort to be above the plan. What? Yes. Resource leaks. People are assigned to your project, but they're working on the other project. Do you know what is the industry's average resource leak? Can be worse in percentage? 50%. 50%. That's the average. Could be worse. I had the CEO of a Fortune 100 company tell me once that after 25 years in the industry, he finally realized what it takes to ship software on time. Finish the previous project. Okay, so you identify a leak. The chart is clearly telling you there's a leak here. People are not even able to spend as much as they should have on your project. What's the natural tendency of when you have a leak? To plug it, right? Don't. Plugging a leak uh, unilaterally tends to make you very unpopular, very quickly. Here's what you do. Typically, they're all going to be leaking to the same project. You look in the old chart, for the manager of the project you are leaking into, and you look for a manager that manages both your project and the other project. There has to be maybe several layers up, there has to be that person. You call a meeting between yourself, the other project, and the top brass. And you show this chart. Immediately the other guy is on the defensive. He doesn't have this chart. All he's good is stealing like a cat burglar in the night, your resources. <laughs> and you say, look, we're leaking here. Mr. Top Level Manager, help me figure out what to do. If you're telling me that that project is more important than mine, that project is what pays the bills, I'm okay with it. I'm a company guy, I'm okay with it, but you know what? That's a new completion date, and I need more resources here or whatever. On the other hand, if you're telling me I'm more important, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to all my developers and say from now on, you're not answering any voicemail, answering any email, going to any meeting, nothing. Don't even talk to them in the hallway. Any glance, you say, talk to my manager. Don't even be the bad guy. I'll be the bad guy. I'm going to say no to everybody. Oh, and by the way, the damage is already done. We have to toss things overboard, push the schedule, and do whatever corrective action because of that guy leaking into me. Help me decide here. Whatever he or she decides, you win. That's how you do it. What's going on here? You kind of hinted at that before. The sand, the, what, what is going on here? You overestimated. So if you're overestimating, you know, by this date, you're already doing here, right? We know overestimating is just as bad as underestimating. 
how would you fix it? One way of fixing it is bring the deadline sooner. Bring the deadline sooner, you make the blue line go up, and you keep bringing it sooner until it meets the, the green line. Another way of the, fixing it is keeping the same deadline, but adding the scope. You are doing more, things from the future stage, we're doing it now. And we make the end value of what you did so far count less, it's going to go down to meet the blue line. Both of these techniques are in a certain degree of risk in case this particular case of nirvana is going to fade. My favorite way of fixing this project is what? Pretty much. Reduce the size of the team. If you let go of people, then the throughput will go down to meet the blue. You're not in, uh, co committing to anything. In fact, you're increasing everybody's productivity because a smaller team is a more efficient team. Right? It's a more effective team, too. Less communication overhead. OK, so what we actually see here is a clear division of labor as far as responsibilities. The architect is the only person in the team qualified to design the project. Think about it. You're the only person understanding the dependency between the services. What should happen before and after? How to integrate it? You can even estimate the effort independent of any other developer. But it's a good way to have separation of authorities here where the project manager is the one tracking it, reporting to top-level management. Both the architect and the project manager in this case needs to close the loop because quite often when a change comes, the project manager can't even make the, the estimation of what's going to be the impact here. Okay? And, you know, I mean, all these things I've discussed with users, all these, we can do this, we can do this, we can do that. Right? And, and you have to decide on these things. All I can do is I can mechanize the act of providing the information, gleaning it, and I can even mechanize telling you what the symptoms mean and possible corrective actions. But you have to decide which corrective action to take. Right? It's a wonderful way of dealing with uh, feature creep. How many times a product manager walks into your office, for pulling a requirement and waltzing away? Come again? Did you just drop a requirement on me? No. You say, they want, to, they want to do something. I say, hold on a second. I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no. What am I saying? Let me get back to you. Correct. You look and you take a look at what's going to be the implication on the critical pass, on the components, the services, and everything else in between, estimate the effort, see what's going to be the effect here. Then you go back to the product manager, and the project manager, you say, look, we can certainly do this. It's going to make this to the schedule, it's going to do this, it's going to do that. You still want to do it? Yes? Good, you just negotiate a new schedule. That's how I was always on schedule and on budget. I would never let these things kind of like accumulate under the surface and without releasing the pressure. Never do that. In fact, as you progress through the project, it's quite likely the architect doesn't even know all the implication of the butterfly effect of doing these things. You have to get the entire team in place and you estimate, look, if we're going to do this, we have to actually go back to the thing we did two months ago, open up, got that, put this, put this inside, and you don't even know what's going to be the implication, all these nasty things lurking there. You get the whole, de the whole developers need to, 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 to estimate that. So my question to you is, if you have to call a meeting and, and seven developers are in a room for two hours, how much time is lost? A day, yes. Every project I ever managed, as an architect as a product, and as a project manager, I had the golden rule with the product manager. Asking any question that starts with, can we do a, uh, implies a mandatory, irrevocable, one-day sleep of schedule. We just move the deadline. Because even answering the question is not free. Now, I'll get you the implication, and then you may well decide if you want to do it or not. But merely asking the question, give me permission to move the schedule by one day. It tends to act as a wonderful calming effect on those guys. <laughs> and now they only bubble up things which are truly important. OK? This tends to build enormous degree of trust between the architect, the project manager, and top level management. Remember, they fundamentally give you impossible deadlines because they don't trust you. And how can they trust what they don't understand or see? But imagine every week you generate these charts, you send an email to everybody upstairs. Here's where we are, we project 8% cost over on uh, this and this, we can do this, we can do this, we can do that. It's all in the open. There's no, nothing to hide. It reverses the relation completely. I can tell you, you can even reduce the number of meetings you spend doing these things. I'll tell you a story here. I used to 
generate these charts every Friday afternoon, and then Monday morning meet with the general manager and uh, show where we are and say, look, uh, we're doing this, we're doing that. Uh, to do this, we can do A, we can do B, we can do C. And she would look at me and she would say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What do you think we should do? I said, we should do B. Fine, let's do B. After the, 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 you know, the MTS time this happened, I said, why am I even wasting her and my time? Every Friday afternoon, I would send an email to everybody upstairs. The project is here, the project is there. We can do A, we can do B, we can do C. And uh, I think we should do B. And unless I hear from anybody by Monday afternoon, we're doing B. There you go. Just leave you alone at this point. Okay? So less time in meetings, more time designing. Life is good. But this really is this good synergy between the architect and the project manager to close the loop here. Okay? Uh, where are we? How much overtime did I go? 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, this is why I, I wanted to actually go uh, the last session here. So I have one more session here. Take it tomorrow. I have App Fabric, uh, Service Bus Design Patterns. None of this meta session, you're going to see semicolons and lots of good uh, patterns and such. Uh, my book, we hope will be published by the end of the summer, has some on how to do this. I also have for you more of these mini CDs. If you haven't taken them, please take now. It's got the spreadsheet in them as well. Some other samples. Please uh, fill up the evaluations, and thank you. <laughs>